Hello everyone, my name is Patricia DiOrio and I'm delighted to be welcoming you to the debut of Get Conscious Now, a new show here on Channel 17. And I'm delighted especially because I'm back doing television. Some of you perhaps will remember that I did a show for 11 years here on Channel 17 called The Paradigm Shift about science and spirituality as one conversation. The premise of the show was that we are spiritual beings having a human experience or you can say energy beings in human form, and that we have this amazing, innate, immeasurable power to create our reality. This is what it means to be conscious. So this new show, Get Conscious Now, is like the next evolutionary step. And this show is dedicated to exploring the many shifts that are occurring today as this level of consciousness seeps into aspects of the community uh, where we normally wouldn't have the spiritual conversation. For example, the business world the financial world, the political world, imagine that, spiritual, spirituality and politics. But it's happening, education, health. So this is an opportunity for us to understand that there is a huge shift that's occurring today. And the guests that you're going to be meeting over, over the next several months are experts in their field. And although the subjects are varied, the one common thread for all of our guests is that they believe that there is a fundamental shift occurring today in society where consciousness rather than the material world is seen as the ground of all being or the foundation of all existence. I'm also very excited to, uh, to be actually co-producing this show with a woman by the name of Patty DeDominic who is an entrepreneur and business coach. And the two of us have formed PD2 Productions. Also a wonderful change for me is that I actually have a co-host this time, and he is a handsome, brilliant, beautiful, witty guy, Stu Zimmerman, who just happens to be sitting to my left, and you're just going to love meeting him. Stu. Patricia, <laughs> sweetheart, thank you so much for inviting me on the program. You're and welcome. I'm not sure if I'm blushing or not, but uh, <laughs> uh, here I am. and. Uh, I just want to say what a blessing it is to be on this journey individually and with all of you in terms of get conscious now. Because uh, to me, it's a bit of an imperative uh, for myself to awaken to a new reality, to awaken to what I know in my heart is true. And when I see things like happening in Boston and elsewhere in our country, let alone around the world, to me, it actually makes it even more uh, of an imperative for me to get conscious now. Uh, and at the same time, as we talk about things like uh, enlightenment, uh, where there's light and enlightening, I'm really excited about the possibility to see how entertainment and how we can enlighten and grow together in ways that are just really feeling absolutely delightful. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, we've got, we're going to have a great guest on today yes. to launch our show, John mm -hmm. Rotz, mm -hmm. who's the founder of GATE, the uh, Global Alliance for Transformational Entertainment. Uh, but before we do, we have our segment of quantum quotes <laughs> in which Patricia is going to share an enlightening quote every, every episode here uh, from a scientist that actually merges science and spirit into one coherent conversation. Right. Patricia? Thank you. Thank you. So this segment called Quantum Quotes, I have a list of quotes that I've been collecting over the years, and mainly from scientists. And of course, my favorite, Uncle Albert, is my favorite, Einstein. So I'd like to share a quote today, my favorite quote from Einstein, that really speaks right to this conversation, that everything is energy, he said, and I'm quoting him exactly. Everything is energy. That's all there is to it. It could be no other way. This is not philosophy. This is physics. So what did Einstein mean by that? Well. Science tells us, quantum physics tells us, that everything that we see in the material world, if you look at it under the proper magnification, is actually empty space. In fact, I heard Deepak Chopra say that, um, that it's 99.9999959's empty space, and that one Scotia percentage that is supposed to be material matter, if you looked at that under the proper magnification, it's also empty. So what is that telling us? It's telling us that this world is essentially an illusion. It's a delusion. Einstein called it an optical delusion of consciousness. So the interesting thing is that everything that appears to be empty, all the space around us, 
the universe inside and outside of us is actually not empty at all. It's filled with an infinite number of subatomic particles, which Einstein discovered, that cannot be seen. They're fluctuations of energy and information in the field of all possibility. So what appears to be empty is filled, and what appears to be filled is empty. So it's, it's like a Zen koan. What does this mean? This means that there is no separation, that we're all interconnected in the web of life. And without our bodies, there's no place where one ends and the other begins. And that's so important for us to be aware of that every day of our lives, because what happens in the Middle East, we feel. What happens in Boston, we feel. What happened in Newtown, Connecticut, we feel everywhere on the globe, because for only one of us here, it's so important for us to understand that. So I want you to think about what I've said here today. When you look at the things around your home that are apparently hard and solid, they're not at all. And what seems to be empty is actually filled. Now, the other piece of this that's so important is that how do these subatomic particles actually come into matter? How does this table come into form? How do our bodies come into form? Our material matter comes into form through our thoughts, through our intentions, through our words, through our feelings, through our speaking. What happens quite literally, quantum physics tells us, is that when we have an intention, whether it's a deliberate intention or an intention by default, and we put that intention out into the field through a thought, it's actually causing the subatomic particles in that field to collapse into a particle of matter. So we're literally creating our reality. And um, when we can create our reality deliberately, instead of by default, then we can create a, our world consciously. We can create our personal lives to be a reflection of our greatest heart's desires, and then we can collectively come together, creating a resonant field where we can create heaven on earth. And I know that may sound like a grandiose vision, but I'm a cosmic optimist and a hopeless optimist, I guess, and I really believe that we can do that as each of us wakes up to this conversation and helps others to wake up as well, create a resonant field where we can co-create heaven on earth. And would you have anything to add to that, my dear? I don't know. You stole all my thunder, you know. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about heaven on earth here. Who's going to top that? No, but <laughs> clearly, I'm here because I very much subscribe to that same notion that you mentioned about what's possible here and the notion of us literally being energy waves at the core, perhaps these uh, you know, bag of chemicals you know, bouncing around the various frequencies. But ultimately, it is an illusion uh, that we're separate. And what excites me about this is when we uh, uh, bring in intention and consciousness into the equation, where perhaps we could start to turn up the dial a little bit and tune in to the energy that we would call you know, love, or we call joy, and see if we can consciously kind of tune into that radio signal energy frequency and have that be uh, more of our default. And as we are all interconnected as such, you know, perhaps we can get this resonant field, which uh, transmits through the TV waves, through, transmits through every time we go through the store and the cashier and the people that we meet on the street, and create a, uh, uh, you know, a, a viral expansionary energetic field mm -hmm. of, of love, joy, peace, and interconnection. And, what ultimately, as uh, you called Uncle Albert, which kind of still reminds me of that Paul McCartney song, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, of, of everything being energy and interconnected, is just really uh, both a, a blessing and an exciting time to be alive and to be on what this uh, journey is with all of us. So thank you for such a beautiful quantum quote. You're welcome. Good luck topping it next time. Okay. <laughs> and uh, let's get to our wonderful guest, John Rotz. Uh, John is the founder of Global Alliance for transformational entertainment. So we're going to find out how we can be transformed and entertained at the same time, which as far as I'm concerned is a great mix. Uh, uh, he's also the founder of the Visioneering Group, which is a marketing, a transformational marketing and PR firm that uh, serves the body, mind, spirit market. And he's represented uh, Eckhart Tolle, you know, the power of now and the new earth author as well as some wonderful movies like What the Bleep and I Am uh, by Tom Shadiak. 
Uh, and John has a, a resume that, you know, he's like been reincarnated many times in the same body. <laughs> and, and one of the incarnations actually had him playing lead guitar for a band uh, where he opened for Alice Cooper and Bob Seger. So I think that's enough of an introduction to find out who this guy is. Uh, John Rotz, thank you so much thank for joining you. us. Thank you, Stu. Thank you, John, thank you Patricia. Here. Thank you very yeah, much. It's really wonderful Pleasure to have Pleasure to be here with you guys. Yeah. I think it's so appropriate that this show is about consciousness in the media. Mm -hmm. And our very first guest is a man that has really devoted his life to bringing consciousness to the media. So uh, transformational media seems to be evolving along with everything else. And uh, so what is your definition of transformational media? Mm. And how would you say that it differs from the traditional media? Yes. Well, first off, I do make a distinction between entertainment and media. Mm -hmm. um, entertainment content, again, could be a movie. It could be a stage play. It could be a CD with music on it. Whereas media, we conceive of more as newspapers, television, radio, uh, you know, the web, etc. So uh, an interesting thing about transformational media, or, or I should say traditional media, is that traditional media tends to be rooted in a set of values <laughs> that have become somewhat outmoded in our current culture. When a person goes to journalism school, they learn a set of values that define news. And those values include things like conflict, controversy, celebrity, proximity, novelty, etc. Um, we believe that there should be additional values added to that definition of news. Values that are universal, humanistic, holistic, perennial. That, that, that is to say values that are common to everybody on the planet everywhere, in all times, in all places. Um, a lot of the news stories today tend to be characterized by the adage, if it bleeds, it leads. And I just don't think that's where our attention should be any longer. That isn't to say there isn't a place for those stories, but there's an imbalance. There's a gross imbalance. And we need to restore balance and even extend it in the direction of more progressive ideas. There are so many amazing things happening on the planet today that do not get reported about mm -hmm. uh, because they don't fit the current paradigm you know, definition of news. Mm -hmm. And we need to supplant that again with this, this newer definition, these values that affect everybody because the old values no longer serve who we've become and, and maybe more importantly, who we want to become. Mm -hmm. Great. So, so let's talk about GATE in this context. Mm -hmm. So the Global Alliance mm -hmm. for Transformational Entertainment. Yes. What, what, are you, what are you doing with that enterprise, that entity, and, and how is it yes. working in the world? Well, first off, you know, the organization is young, and already it's had a pretty strong influence on the entertainment and media communities. And when the idea first emerged for GATE, um, I resisted it for a very long time. And then one day I went to Eckhart, and I shared the idea with him, and he encouraged me to do it. And I asked him if, if I do, would he you know, do it with me and maybe uh, uh, co-host the first event? And he said yes. Then I went to my, my friend and colleague Jim Carey and I asked him um, if he would co-host the event with Eckhart and I if we did it. And he said yes. So the very first event we had was in June of 2009. And in a sense, it was to test my sanity. Was this a completely insane idea? Or are there actually professionals in the entertainment and media communities who would resonate with this vision of transforming the world by transforming entertainment and media? And um, we ended up getting the Zanuck Theater on the Fox Studios lot for our event. We had 500 seats, and every seat was taken, and we turned almost 1,600 people away. Wow. So this showed us that, yeah, this probably is an idea whose time has come and probably has some currency in the world today. So we've been working the last couple of years to develop the idea. We became a nonprofit organization. We created the Imaginal Award, which is our version of an Oscar or a Grammy Award. Mm -hmm. We created a little seal called the Gate Seal. It's kind of like a good housekeeping seal of approval. We've had many events. We have a three-page long um, listing of programs and initiatives that we've undertaken. Um, we have a campaign called The Audience is Ready. Hollywood does not know so much that there is an audience out there that many people refer to as the cultural creatives. 
And one of our jobs is to help Hollywood become aware that this audience exists, it's real, and that they have certain needs, certain desires for certain kinds of entertainment and media content, and they're not currently being served as much as they really want to be or maybe even deserve to be. Mm -hmm. So Gate is actively involved in helping uh, wake up Hollywood to the existing realities of transformation. Mm -hmm. You know the new show with Kiefer Sutherland, what called Touch on Fox Entertainment. I'm aware of it. Yeah. I haven't seen aware it. Of it. Yeah. I'm just I'm just wondering, you know, whether or not that's the sign of the times now, where we're going to start seeing more shows about consciousness coming on that are not just on the Sci-Fi Channel, mm -hmm. but are really about uh, possibilities that people perhaps haven't thought of, and yes. maybe you know this idea of this child being highly intuitive and and yes. and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Prophetic. Um, would seem out there for a lot of people. Yes. But for others, it's really speaking right into their own experiences Exa of perhaps what, yes. you know, they, they don't even know where to go with some of the experiences that they're having or yes. th that we're having. So I, I think it's... Yeah, and, and you know, the interesting thing about that, if, if you look historically for the last 25 years or so, when I, when I first started, in my, through my PR firm, when I first started pitching mainstream media, ideas about consciousness and yoga and meditation and holistic healing and so on they pretty much all thought I was crazy and you know what are you talking about and now of course you know many years later all of those have gone mainstream America mm -hmm. there's an upward trend and even if you look at programming content whether it's television or radio uh, or any number of other channels uh, there, has, there is a proliferation of transformational content. Some people would call it spiritual, some people call it conscious. It goes by you know, many names, but it's all about the fact that our uh, experience is shifting. Our values and our lifestyle preferences are changing, and they're changing in the direction of a very progressive direction. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think the trend is toward more and more content, such as touch. And even if you look at the number of films, that are coming out now mm -hmm. uh, that are considered transformational films. Granted, the quality may not be as, as, uh, uh, as a Hollywood film is in terms of production values, mm -hmm. but the fact is, you know, today compared to even just 2004 when What the Bleep Do We Know came out, mm -hmm. there have been hundreds and hundreds of movies now. Mm -hmm. So there is this proliferation taking place on the planet, mm -hmm. this um, expansion of transformational entertainment and media content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just want to add that I saw the Peaceful Warrior, and I thought mm. that was mm. really high quality. I mean, Absolutely. that should have gone very well done. Very well. Oh done. my! I mean, I could not believe that that did not just skyrocket ah. to its success. Well, Maybe it was an idea whose time had come then. I mean, whose time had not yet come. Well, you know, it, it's it's to this day I'm I, I, I'm vexed by that because yeah. I worked on the film. I was I was head of marketing uh, on the body mind spirit side and. Um, this is a case where the releasing distributor did not understand the audience for the film. And this is a continuing uh, problem, I would mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the Body, Mind, Spirit audience loves to communicate, to engage as we're engaging right now. With what the bleep, at, at, you know, when a performance happened, showing of the film, people wanted to stay behind and they wanted to talk to one another about what they had just experienced. Mm -hmm. And of course the theater owners were like, move on, move on. So we were getting phone calls all the time about you know, what's wrong with these people. They want to stay in the theater and talk about the movie and we've got another showing coming. So we said to them, it's okay, eliminate one of the showings, give people more time to talk and connect with one another. That's what people want. They're using films and other kinds of content in this way to connect with each other, to create community, to build community. It's so important. And that's why at Gate we believe that the entertainment media channels may be among the final channels remaining to propagate wisdom-based messages. We know big government isn't going to get the job done. We know basically our educational system can't get it done. You know, uh, the family structure isn't probably doing the best job that it could be doing, right? And, uh, you know, not to mention, forget about military and what have you. So yeah, we won't the, go there. the option that's left is really entertainment and media, and those channels are still open, mm -hmm. and there are still enough people, aware people, in those channels 
to help move this content through it mm -hmm. to help the world. Mm -hmm. Well, all those structures you just mentioned that really don't seem like they're capable of doing it, you know, they're all really based ultimately in, in separatist thinking. Yes. And so they're just, it doesn't equate on some level. Yes. And you know, you mentioned earlier about politics and you said, can you imagine politics? Well, I, I'd like to mention, are, are you guys familiar with Congressman Tim Ryan of Ohio? Yes, yes. I just okay. read an article. I would love, love, love to interview him if I could. Has well, he ever come to California? Well, yes, he spoke at our gate event in, in this past February. Mm -hmm. And um, I've become friends with him since. I was there. Oh, yes, Yeah, okay. I was there. Amazing, he wrote a book uh, called A Mindful Nation. And as far as I know, he's the first politician to call for the practice of meditation in our country to help reduce stress and restore balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you see, even in politics, every area of human concern mm -hmm. or consideration is being reinvented or recast mm -hmm. in the light of consciousness. Because people such as ourselves who've been practicing some form of spirituality mm -hmm. for a long time, mm -hmm. we've now grown up with that and we wanna bring that into our work. We want to imbue our work with that consciousness, right. whether it's business or religion or spirituality or entertainment, media, what have you, healthcare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's, it, the yeah. shift is happening. That's what this show's about. Yes. It's about that shift. Yes, yeah. very good. Dennis Kucinich, I have to put a hand in for Dennis <laughs> Kucinich. I mean, Absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree. Tim, Tim Ryan is the first one to bring mindfulness certainly into yes. it. But, and, and mindfulness is happening too. And, and your friend uh, in the Silicon Valley, right, who's bringing mindfulness to the corporate world? Yeah, exactly. Mindfulness is definitely a, a topic of conversation. It's in vogue yes. now. Well, whose time has come, and, and even yeah. businesses are starting starting to realize that there actually can be a deep connection yes. between consciousness and their financial bottom line, yes. which of yeah. course may not be the ultimate motivator to get into a consciousness uh, uh, program, but yes. you know, I guess on one level it's like whatever it takes. Yes. But I've also noticed that even in within spiritual circles, sometimes you know, the egos bleed through a little bit and it's difficult to get the collaboration and the, uh, you know, the alliances because yes. I'll bring out the A of gate here, yes. <laughs> you know, the alliances yes. that, you know, can go from taking things from an individual thought to, to a collective and, and everything. And so to that extent, how is it for you to work with yes. an Eckhart Tolle <laughs> and to work with a Jim Carrey? Yeah. Well, wow. you know, I, I'd like to answer that in a roundabout way, if I may. Please. Mm -hmm. um, because I think what you just spoke of in terms of alliance is, is really a key idea. In fact, it's the second prong of our threefold mission, which is um, connection and collaboration. Mm -hmm. It's so important to connect people and get them collaborating on this kind of content. But I, I, there was a movie that came out a couple of years ago called Soul Surfer. Maybe you saw it. It was about the young woman. Yes, yes. I remember that. Yeah. Yes. Well, when, yeah. Well, shark attack. Right? Exactly. Yes. And you know, I wasn't going to go see it because it was a faith-based movie, and um, I, I, I admit I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder. I didn't really want to be preached to, um, or so I thought. And I decided because of, of um, a couple friends prompting me to go. I went to see it and I realized, you know, faith-based entertainment is a cousin to transformational entertainment. So get rid of the chip on your shoulder, John. You know, embrace it. Don't push it away. Don't separate from it. And um, I realized, though, that, that faith-based entertainment has a tendency to be exclusive, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whereas transformational entertainment tends to be inclusive. Right. Yes. Okay. That's probably the primary distinction. Mm -hmm. But I said, if gate is for real, if what we're trying to do is for real, we must be inclusive. So I decided I was going to find uh, someone in the faith-based community, my counterpart, and contact that person and try to form an alliance. And so I ended up contacting a gentleman named Scott Nearing, who wrote a book called You Are What You See. And he's a fundamentalist Christian and mm -hmm. is, has, is a, is a, is a uh, prominent uh, critic, uh, film critic in, in that community. And I called him and I said, Scott, you know, here's what we're up to, but please, can we not talk about religion, but instead can we talk about what I think might bring us together. Mm -hmm. And I believe you want to make the world a better place and I want to make the world a better place. Can we start there? And after we had a couple of conversations, I felt inspired to invite him to speak at a gate event. Mm -hmm. Now, 
after I invited him, I kind of swallowed um, hard, and, and I think he did the same thing. Like, what did we just agree to? <laughs> right. But he came, this was just a couple months ago, and spoke at our Transformational Story Conference. And he was so well received, and he ended up during a break and subsequently in an email thanking me and saying, you know, this was so important for me to be here we Christians can learn so much from you guys about inclusivity. And it was a wonderful connection, and I want to keep that connection going. We are all in this together, and we've got to work. In the, during this time of shift, we've all got to work together to help facilitate it more and more. And we've got to let go of things that, that separate us and divide us, whether it's religion, government, whatever it might be. Mm. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. Mm. So how are you bringing in Eckhart Tolle and Jim Carrey? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, Eckhart and Jim are, are, are the honorary co-founders of GATE. And, um, you know, they're kind of the figureheads because when I started this, you know, who's John Rotz and who's going to listen to him and these far-flung ideas about transforming the world by transforming entertainment and media. I intentionally asked Eckhart and Jim because I figure with them bookending me, people are going to listen, I would hope. And they have, they did, and they have. So their roles in GATE pretty much are, you know, figurehead um, mm -hmm. to support it. And, of course, they do provide <laughs> guidance and counsel whenever we seek it. Um, although right now I will also say I'm working with Jim on his very first children's book called How Roland Rolls. And, you know, you, you speak of interconnection. The book is about our interconnectedness. And it's a story about a wave on the ocean named Roland who basically forgot that he was the ocean. And the story is the story of how he remembers by going deep, I am the ocean. It's a beautiful, beautiful mm, metaphor. And it'll sense. be out in September of this year. And we're self-publishing it. And it's, it's quite an exciting project. Wow. Yeah. Fun. That sounds great. Yeah. 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 It's a powerful metaphor. Mm. And it's so true. We mm. get caught up in thinking that we're by ourselves when we're a part of this whole that yes. is completely connected. That's right. Yeah. Um, I can remember Eckhart Tolle saying once I listened to his audios and read his books and saying that the whole thing about being present, you know, that, that we're present about 30 seconds out of every day. Mm. When I heard that, I went, my God, 30 seconds. So it's been my, my goal, you know, to really find more of a balance in my life between my humanity and my, in my divinity by being present more than 30 seconds a day. Mm. So uh, the question I want to ask you is about that balance, you know, that, that balance between our humanity and our divinity. Yes. Do you find that, that, you know, given the fact that you've come from a very secular world in a way, I mean, you've come from the music industry, you've come from Wall Street, you've, you've come from the entertainment industry, the marketing industry with the Visioneering Group, and, and yet you have a very, very strong spiritual background with everything that you've done from the time you were a young man. Mm -hmm. Do you find that now in your life with this project moving forward gate that you're able to really find to be closer to that fulcrum? Yes. Yeah, and what I think is it's that like? well I think it's it's been a natural uh, well to use a, f a common phrase it's been a natural evolution. Um, my path started in 1967 and uh, I would like to say it culminated um, or so I thought uh, a, a couple of years ago but it really didn't it turns out there are, really the path is infinite. I don't believe there's an end to it. Mm -hmm. I think there are stages, I think there are cycles, but as a path, it's infinite. And um, I, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I had a, a personal experience that uh, shifted me, that shifted my perception, that shifted the way I relate to people, it shifted even a lot of the kinds of things I do during the day and realized that, you know, that is kind of what Eckhart had been speaking about. And, and not only Eckhart, but of course many people, many teachers throughout the ages have pointed to that. And, you know, the interesting thing is that um, the simplicity of the experience is such that you do miss it if you're looking for it. And it seems when you stop looking for it, uh, or when that seeking naturally evaporates, that it kind of presents itself in a much fuller expression. You know, mm -hmm. so for me, when this shift occurred within, uh, the seeking impulse kind of evaporated, mm -hmm. and there the, the questions gone. There were no longer any questions. Mm -hmm. The desire to seek a teacher evaporated, mm -hmm. and um, 
I, I found that there was a natural balance that came in, in during the day. Truthfully, I still disrupt it all the time because, you know, the interesting thing about that experience is the mind can come back in and interpret things in a particular way that are habitual and that really are no longer um, who you are as presence, mm -hmm. but uh, the mind still has a tendency to play. So, and that's why I say the journey goes on because one can think, okay, I have this experience and that's it, but it's not true. You know, there, there is, I believe, a state or that, that will occur one day where that is stable or more stable mm -hmm. and where it's um, kind of the foreground of your experience uh, much more than just a few seconds every day. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be what's occurring right now. I've had that experience, but many people I know mm -hmm. are having that experience now. I think the shift needs to be away from seeking enlightenment. is like, uh, like holding a carrot on the end of a stick and trying to get the carrot. You know, yeah. you're never going to find the carrot because we're already there. We're exactly. already enlightened. So yes. I think that's really an important distinction to know is that we're already there and we just need to be present to it. That's right. Very and good point. Right. As a, and as infinite, ultimately infinite beings, there really is no there, there. <laughs> there's always more. There's always something beyond to, to grow into or, or yeah. to expand into. And uh, I know we all have our own individual journeys of, of awakening and of, uh, uh, of consciousness, uh, enlightenment, if you want to call it that, uh, or at least becoming aware of our own, our own light in, in that way. And, and John, I know you and I have had conversation uh, on the phone about this recently, uh, where we, we started talking about the dark night of the soul yes. and the role that that deep sense of uh, potentially angst or, yes. or deep questioning yes is part of a process mm -hmm. uh, 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 for many of us for, mm -hmm. for awakening. Why don't you just share a little bit of your thoughts there? Yeah, and you know, um, my, con uh, my current conclusion is that that proverbial dark night of the soul is part of a natural cycle of things. Um, I like to refer to it as the natural unfolding of life. I, I, I remind myself frequently, uh, trust in the process of life unfolding um, almost every day now because you can encounter a circumstance, an inner circumstance, an outer circumstance that might uh, cause the mind to want to react. But um, I find that just by you know getting quiet again and just reminding myself, trust in the process of life unfolding, whatever is there in your field of experience, embrace it and be with it, go with it and that things will just settle into a natural place. And yes, there might be some discomfort still but that discomfort doesn't overshadow your grander experience. Um, you can peacefully coexist with it and work with it and not resist it and simply allow it to be. And I have found that by doing so, you go through that experience much more comfortably and much more naturally. You know, I'm also wondering as uh, more of us awaken even more into, into the greater fullness and, and the knowing of what we are at the core of our essence, mm -hmm that in some ways it's almost like a, a blazing a bit of a trail for all these other beloveds that we're interconnected with. Yeah. You know, when Lewis and Clark came across the country here, they got pretty bloody because they had to cut through all the thorns. Yeah. And I'm not saying that my process can, can substitute right. for somebody else's awakening, yes. but to the extent that we create this resonant field of harmonic uh, love and peace and, and excitement, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that may actually uh, facilitate some people <coughs> and not having to go through the, the depth of potential despair or mm -hmm. discomfort mm -hmm. that you may have or that I may have, mm -hmm. yes. just to be humble to the possibility yes. of uh, us all having different journeys in a way. Sure. Well, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's an accident that people like us are involved in this work because we've been preparing for it our whole lives and we're going through the forest first with the machetes and we are creating a path mm -hmm. to make it easier for people that are coming behind us. Yes. And we've had to go through our dark nights of the soul over and over and over again. Yes. And you know, we, I know personally that this is my life's work because diligence, persistence, tenacity mm -hmm. and relentlessness have been my primary qualities that have kept me going no matter what's been happening in my life you know so and it's wonderful to have that passion you know oh absolutely and, and let us not forget those who came before mm. who blazed absolutely. the path that we currently traverse mm -hmm. because I, I don't remember I believe it was Francis Bacon who said if I have seen 
uh, farther than others, it is because I, I have stood on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. And if we think of that, spiritually speaking, um, of course, there have been so many teachers over the ages, um, whether it's Buddha or Ramana Maharshi or any number of Ramakrishna, any number of other teachers from all different traditions and right. paths mm -hmm. who have had these same experiences. Again, I believe this is just another yes. cycle that, that, that many humans go, continuously go through throughout the ages. Mm -hmm. Ours happens to be in this current context of, of the society we live in, but, but I think it's happened really to every generation since time immemorial. And you know, think of what the challenges were like for people who first started you know, becoming aware um, of themselves as conscious beings and you know the struggles they must have gone through inwardly you know in the context of where they found themselves geographically sociologically etc and just you know think of all those people and we're now standing on their shoulders mm -hmm. and traversing this path that's a really good point yeah, yeah. yeah excellent point you know yesterday Stu and I were talking about the show and our interview with you and he was sharing with me in your conversation with him mm -hmm. that you're uh, working with schools, colleges now, and the possibility mm. of having a transformational media curriculum. Yeah. That is so exciting yeah. and so mm, fortuitous yes. you know, and hopeful. Well, it has to do with the future and future generations. Um, you know, probably you guys know the story of the seventh generation and how many Native American tribes would sit together, probably around, you know, in a circle, and they would, they would hold counsel, and they would entertain important decisions as a group. And they determine, if they determine that a particular decision um, would affect negatively any one of the next seven generations, they simply wouldn't do that thing. Mm. They had that kind of, that quality of foresight, you know, seven generations ahead. Wow. Today, we're thinking about the next quarter. Okay, mm -hmm. but back then people were thinking about you know seven generations, so um, I think that is a really important uh, consideration for us now. And I'm sorry, remind me because I forgot what the the the, the consideration was. Oh, the colleges. bringing colleges, yes, colleges. Yeah, bringing yeah. transformation. So, yeah. so we thought you know at Gate we're thinking how can we positively impact students and help bring what we're doing you know into that space. Um, and in the last six weeks, there have been some amazing developments. Gate won an award, uh, the Visionary Award from the Producers Guild. And um, I ended up speaking at the World Bank in Washington, D.C. about transformational entertainment media wow. uh, on the stage with a Nobel Peace Prize laureate and the president of the World Bank. And it was quite wonderful. And we also became, we, we got in touch with Pacifica Graduate Institute through, through one of our supporters, D Dara Marks who, you know, for my money, is, is the godmother of transformational story. Uh, she wrote a book called Inside Story, The Power of the Transformational Art. Highly recommend the book. Mm. And um, she made the connection for us with Pacifica. We entered into conversations with them and determined that we should work together to create the world's first curriculum in transformational wow. entertainment media. So our planning sessions start early May. Oh, that's yeah. so exciting. It is. Yeah. yeah, we have a Pacifica up here, too. Well, that's... That's the one. Oh, you're talking about that. That's yeah. right. What I'm thinking of. What am I thinking of in L.A.? Right, 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 right. No, I was thinking of um, Marymount. I'm sorry. Yes. So yes. now are these individual classes, or is it actually like a, designed to be a full-blown uh, like department and curriculum with a degree in? Yes. Well, I, su I suspect that we will start more modestly and build mm -hmm. to that. Um, what I'm anticipating is a series of, of courses, maybe, I don't know, 6, 8, 10, 12 courses, and then it becomes a certificate program for continuing education credits, and then it develops from there into a full-blown you know, degree at some point. But we're, we're going to envision all of that you know, starting in May. That is so sure. exciting. Yeah. It, it yeah. really is. It's, and it's so, I'm thrilled that it's here in California as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Well, it would be here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Hollywood, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't know that it could be too many other places right now. <laughs> and don't you, don't you feel that, you know, when I see the Academy Awards and I see some of the, the winners that come up there. I mean, they're in the conversation. You can tell that they really oh. are there. You know, and they want to be able to exert their influence, their sphere of influence to bring the conversation out, but they, you know, they kind of have to dance with you know, yes. what would be safe and not mm -hmm. jeopardizing their okay. reputations. This is an important point you've just raised. There is a schism in Hollywood 
The schism is between the business people and the creatives. Mm -hmm. It used to be that the creatives had much more input into so many aspects of the creative process. Not so much anymore. It's all business decisions. You know, in a sense, the film business is going the way of the music business, the publishing business. It's kind of painting itself in a corner, and it's basically doing these mega budget, you know, special effects driven films, sequels, prequels, you know, um, what have you. Uh, and a lot of the creativity has been squeezed out of the business and relegated to the back seat. I believe that the schism that exists between the business people and the creative people must be healed and that the artists, to a much greater extent, must be put back in charge of the creative process. They see things that most of us don't see. Artists traditionally have always been the storytellers, and they have seen things that most people do not see. They've forged the pathways for us. So I'm, all in, I'm, I'm a big advocate of artists' rights. I believe artists should control the rights to their creative output and that business people exist to make it happen, make it successful, and to share in the proceeds. You know, this conversation goes way beyond the bottom line as we, as we know the bottom line to be. And mm -hmm. the interesting thing is about it is that when we can bring consciousness into the entertainment industry, media, um, politics, and I think that is definitely possible, um, and even the whole consciousness into religion, that, that bottom line is going to flourish because we're going to be deliberately creating our world. And why wouldn't we want to have prosperity yes. and abundance and financial freedom? Absolutely. Why not? Absolutely. You know, it's right. not about wearing a hair shirt and meditating 24-7. It's really <laughs> about living life in balance and having a great life, however we want that to be. Yes. yes. And especially if the demand is there, there actually is a financial motive, and which also then starts bringing consciousness into perhaps you know the, the final frontier yes. of finance yes. because finance and economics 101 you know the allocation of scarce resources it's all built on separation and it's yes. all based on scarcity yes. and so to which is absolutely contrary to the conversation we're having here about consciousness and uh, absolutely the, and, the and nature of things look at all of the uh, refinements that are that are taking place in the arena of finance now like the slow money movement I think that would be a very interesting show for you guys mm -hmm. to consider. Hmm. Um, and at Gate 3 that we just held in, in, in February, mm -hmm. um, I invited Amy Domini, yes. who's one of the mm -hmm. kind of the godmothers She's of on our guest list. Yes, absolutely. Socially mm -hmm. responsible yes. investing. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's so important that people like her uh, lead the charge of forging a new economic system for our country and for the world. And you know, uh, Stu, w when I introduced you, I was hoping that you would talk a little bit about your background because here you were graduating from Cornell and going into finances, Thanks, Mom and Dad. right? <laughs> into finances, and right. spent all those years on Wall Street making money and doing oh. that whole thing, that whole dance, and then, you know, having your own experience. You know, perhaps you could just take a moment to share that. That I'm really happy to. brought you I'm happy into to. the whole spiritual yeah. work. And the, and the reason why I didn't in the, in the start of the program here is because I felt like I was going to be on a date or something and find myself <laughs> talking about myself all day. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> despite what people think, it's really not about me. <laughs> Although sometimes I feel that way. And no, seriously, um, yeah, I actually spent 17 years in the financial services industry, uh, stockbroker, uh, options trader on the floor of the exchange getting spit on and ultimately being a hedge fund manager, uh, if you could believe that. And uh, ironically, at, at the peak of my financial success in the late 90s, uh, my wife was diagnosed with cancer, and everything I thought money was going to buy me and my family turned out to be hollow and untrue. Mm -hmm. And really, you know, it was like a spiritual two-by-four upside my head. Say, what is the nature of reality? What is the, you know, why am I here? Who am I? The existential questions in life. Yes. And also, specifically for me, what is this thing about security and wealth that not only me, but all these brilliant people with degrees and the brightest people in the world are spending 24 7 focused on? What is it all about? And I came to understand that wealth and security, there is no number for that, it's a state of being. It's literally like tuning into that dial of an energetic frequency where there's more than enough. Or with security, just this place of peace in knowing that all is well. And it's just simply a blessing just to exist in this form. 
for whatever limited time only it is. Thank you very much. And so that's why I'm here, <laughs> is to be on that exploration, John, with you and Patricia, and thank you. And don't <laughs> forget to mention your book. Oh, yes. thank you. Uh, no, he didn't mention Take the marketing either. guy to remind me of this. Like, Jesus, <laughs> feel like you can tell. Plug your book right now, Yes, too. okay, plug the book. So, yes, and so part of the journey had me write a book, uh, co-author a book with Jared Rosen called Inner Security and Infinite Wealth, subtitled Merging Self-Worth and Net Worth. And it's a great book. It is well, a thank great you. book. thank you. Thank you. So thank you for that. And uh, Well, you know how I met this guy. He was a guest on my show. For the paradigm shift. Oh. Because the paradigm shift was about science yes. and spirituality and yes. everything that was about that world, you know. And I thought, oh my God, a man that wrote a book about inner security, infinite wealth, merging self worth with net yes. worth. I said, we have to have him. So that's how I met okay, him. Okay, so I'm an authority. So listen up. Ten years later. <laughs> so ten years later, here yes. we are, and he's co-hosting a show. Beautiful. Our own evolution. That's you great. know. I know we'll be winding up the interview shortly, and I want to get to some grounded action steps sure. uh, that our viewers can take here mm. to, to support yes. transformational media yes. uh, and entertainment. So, so mm -hmm. what, what do you recommend people actually do? Well, number one, um, pers for themselves, pay attention to their media diet. Look at what you're consuming in terms of news, in terms of entertainment content, where do you get your news from, what kinds of media do you partake of, because you know what, we, we metabolize all of that, mm -hmm. you know, at many different levels, and it's important to really consider, you know, should I be listening to CNN or Fox News, or maybe Alternet, you know, where I'm going to get news that I can't find on CNN or Fox News, certainly not on Fox News, no. um, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, pay attention to your media diet, you know, and it's, it's what, you know, Scott said in his book, you are what you see, um, and so forth. Um, the other thing, in terms of gate, it's so important that we demonstrate to Hollywood uh, in the broadest and deepest sense of that term, so it includes entertainment and media, uh, it's important that we demonstrate to them that we, the cultural creatives, the body, mind, spirit community, uh, global citizens, um, intelligent optimists, all of these different terms are pointing in the same direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's important that we demonstrate to the entertainment and media infrastructures that we exist and that we do want to hold them more accountable for better quality entertainment and media content. Mm -hmm. So they can go to the Gate website and there's a little button somewhere there um, they can, they can um, push and they can sign an electronic petition to count themselves as a, as a supporter of transformational entertainment and mm -hmm. media. Mm -hmm. Do you think that in the cultural creative movement, which has been around a lot, a yes. long time ago, Paul long Ray time. wrote the book a long time ago, yes. um, that there, there's this level of spiritual awareness that is just as, uh, let's say, profound and deep as the whole environmental conversation? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I believe that the, envir I mean, the environmental conversation is a part of the cultural creatives milieu. Um, it's, it's certainly, you know, the environment is one of the values that cultural creatives hold in very, very high regard and esteem. And um, so, yes, to answer your question. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Oh, well, um, I'm going to give you the last question here, sure. right? And that is quite simply, if you could give... Um, a pearl of wisdom, or what, what is it that you would like to share with our audience? If you, to leave something with our audience that they can really take to heart and incorporate in their lives, what would that be? You know, I think for all of us today, and it's something you pointed to earlier in the conversation, um, I think it is really about balance. Um, it's about equanimity, because it is in the state of equanimity or balance when we're not moving to this extreme or to that extreme. And I, I believe wherever there's an extreme, there is an imbalance. So, you know, as difficult as it is sometimes, I believe that striving for that balance is, is, is really con takes care of so many different aspects of our lives. Mm -hmm. And it's a struggle. For me, it's a struggle in many ways and mm -hmm. for others. And yet within there is still that peace. And the other thing I want to mention, I was interviewed not long ago and someone mentioned um, are you happy? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, to me it's an irrelevant question because that's not what I strive for anymore because <laughs> happiness comes and goes just like sadness, just like pleasure, just like pain. Mm -hmm.
But what remains still is just that inner calm, that inner peace, and I will take that any day over being happy. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I think that when we have that inner calm and that inner peace, yes. we, we are happy. Yes. And, and another action step that, that I would see very important, mm -hmm. be, that would be very important, would be developing mindfulness in our lives, mm -hmm. developing a time of our day, whether it's 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or more, where we can really just be present to our true nature yes. and be quiet and follow our breath and I think that sets us up then to find that balance that we're seeking. And that's a wonderful next show. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you very thank much. You. Thank you. Stu, thank you. So uh, consciousness uh, means being of great character. And we on this new show, Get Conscious Now, have a great character. And I'd like you to meet him now. He is Pastor Present. Thank you, Patricia. Hello. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Yes, uh, Pastor Present is, in fact, a name. Uh, <laughs> it's a character. And it's also a choice. What do you want to live? In the past or present? Past or present? Past or present? I know you get it. Okay? Because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> truly, get conscious now. It's about now. And... We demand the na out of the now. What do we demand? We demand the best of technology, the fastest iPhones, the most bandwidth we can imagine, computers working at faster and faster speeds. That's what we demand. Yet somehow we don't demand the same thing of our uh, relationship to all that is because there is so much that we have learned since then. You know, our minds uh, are, are computers in a way processing information at faster and faster speeds. And like all computers, we have an operating system that we were born with, actually, an operating system in OS. That just so happens the OS stands for Original Sin, <laughs> you know, which, uh, <laughs> got to tell you, it's more like Original Spin. That's right. Because Original Sin really is a story of separation. Adam and Eve down here in a garden, ran around naked, everything as well. All of a sudden, they take a bite of an apple they're not supposed to. They cover up in shame. God is up there. Oh, my God. Next thing you know, we've got all of the bugs of this program. And this program is literally insidious because through the program of separation, we have created all of our geopolitical systems, all of our economic systems, all of our educational systems, family systems, legal systems. They're all based on the notion of us and them whoever we are and whoever they are. And the bugs associated with this program, and we're seeing signs all over the world of how it's breaking down, it really isn't working anymore. Shame, guilt, judgment, exclusionary, those are the symptoms of this old program, this old operating system that just doesn't work anymore. You know, it's, and, and oh, by the way, it's not even true, because let's, 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 let's go to uh, Uncle Albert for a moment from the quantum quote. You know, everything is energy. Everything is energy, that includes us. So there's a new operating system that is very much available to us right now, and it's time to reboot. And the new OS stands for only source. <laughs> only the source of all things exists. Everything is energy, everything is consciousness, unified field, God, spirit, source, universe, whatever you want to call it, life itself, there is one something going on here, whether it's a wave, a, a, a drop of water, or the ocean, it's inseparable as we are. We are inseparable from that. And the other aspect of the OS is that it's an open source, which means there are infinite ways to connect and reconnect with our own infinite nature. So I really want you to take that to heart, as much as witty as it could possibly be here, is that we are interconnected as energy. Everything is energy, including us. And that is the ultimate choice for you to make. What are you going to live in the past or present? Patricia. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so the debut of past or present on cable. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's come and gone. <laughs> So we have just a couple of minutes to wrap up, John, and I know that you gave us that wonderful pearl of wisdom, which all of us will take to heart. Uh, I guess I want to, I'd like to just ask you one last question about GATE. Where do you see it going from here? Um, well, I hope that within a few years' time, 
uh, we will have mobilized all of those people in the, in the mainstream entertainment media communities who are themselves transformationally oriented, but have not really had a place where they could go and share that experience with others. I'd like to make sure that all of them have an opportunity to do that through GATE, and that it really does lead to collaborations that will lead to new programming, and that will lead to new ways of relating to artists in the business, and that will really create, uh, and I'm not saying it should be only this way, we're very careful to not castigate the mainstream entertainment business because it does no good to do that. No. They should keep doing what they're doing. We're only asking for a little bit of space in which to grow this particular brand or variety. Mm -hmm. That's it, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, great. Well, I will hold that intention every day in my heart for that to happen. Thank yeah, you. That's great. Well. Thank you. So this has been very much fun. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. And um, I look forward to doing future shows with you, my co-host there, Stu. Yeah, it feels like we've had more than 30 seconds of presence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been wonderful having you, John, to, you. to you launch both. our show. And this will be, airing it will be airing this week and then several times a week for the next month. So, yeah. And we might call on you to perhaps give us some suggested names. Absolutely. You know, I'd that, be happy that, you, to. That, that you think would be appropriate for the show. So thank you, everyone, for watching this show today, Get Conscious Now. And it's my personal dream and vision that we can speak deeply into your heart and your listening to help you come into alignment with your own level of consciousness so that you can make a difference in your life by finding that place in you that where you're one with all else on the planet. And Stu, do you have anything to say in closing? Yeah, love each other. Love yourself. Have some fun. Get conscious now. <laughs> Pass the hat. Pass the hat. Great. 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 Thank you. It's really been great.